Hello, this is episode four on title, and we'll be talking about finding abstraction in furnitures. Hi, I'm Amber. I'm Felicia. Before we talk about some specific furnitures, what do you think is the definition of furnitures? I think that is important for our understanding. Yeah, furniture usually refers to semi-functional objects, um, indoors and outdoors, that serve specific purposes. Why it is semi-functional? If a chair is not suitable, is that still a furniture? Well, trying to really define furniture and strict boundaries is difficult in that the term has developed over the years and has now become flexible and oftentimes subjective. But specifically in our episode, we'll be talking about pieces that are meant to be functional. So yes, suitable and produced for sale. So to talk about the Danish designer Werner Pantone, he was a very big figure in design at the time he was alive. So obviously the Pantone chair, also known as the stacking chair or the S chair for the shape, is one of his most successful pieces along the cone and heart chairs on the living tower and so forth because of how they all encompass very strong colors and experimentation of materials and its engagement with the body that's put in. So before he became a well-known designer, he joined the resistance during World War II and uh, Pantone and his fellow Danish designers are enthusiastic with designing and experimenting with new material, especially plastic, plexiglass, steel from rubber and other synthetic materials, which related to the industry. However, this chair was successful for very first single form injection molded plastic chair. So this was really notable in that, first of all, injection molding is a process where you have a mold of an object and you put in molten material such as like steel or polymer, in this case as it's polyurethane, and you make this very thin shell out of the mold. This process allowed the S chair to be intended for the public and was mass produced. Its first batch was of 150 chairs. The polyurethane plastic and the shape of the chair, which is very like legless, allowed them to be stackable. And this was a very new concept that was introduced in areas of furniture. So Pantone's chair and a lot of his works were linked to pop culture and what was also called Danish modernism. Pop culture is a new culture at that time, and the pop culture trends passed on in speed, and the sustainability of objects were devalued. Humor was accepted in furniture design, simulating multi purpose pieces and radical forms that depend on mass production cycles. Less of material labor and craftsmanship is intended to put in each piece. Pantone also thought of his interior spaces as environments and wanted to explore the possibilities within the environments. So even though a lot of his works are very notable as like individual furniture pieces that are mass produced, we should really take a look at these environments that he wanted to really stretch the parameters of design. To elaborate on the term environment that's suggested by Werner Pantone, the artist and designer, I want to use one example, the multifunctional living unit, which constructed uh, by him in 1966. It is a prototype of the concept living unit. The multifunctional living unit is a two-level, small, half-open cube area. It contains lounge or sitting spots, almost like a bunk bed enlarged and repurposed for family use. It was constructed with chrome-plated steel frame, wood and foam, upholstery and red nylon velours. It is on one hand very minimal design and used the structure of traditional house as a reference. But on the other hand, the avant-garde furniture it includes and the overbright color suggests something else. Another example would be the Visiona 0 and 2, which are Pantone's fantasy landscapes. For this, he takes into account human senses, especially of feelings and physical behaviors when creating these environments. Pantone himself had studied colors and their psychological effects since his early life and applied this knowledge to how he creates the atmospheres for his environments. He says, the main focus of my own work is on the overall result. 
interaction with the setting is far more important than that with just a chair or any other object. A room, a color, furniture, textiles, and lighting must be considered as a whole. An attractive setting can only be created if all of its components are truly mastered. To achieve this, he designs every aspect of a spaces, from the walls, the ceilings, the furnitures, and the light. For example, with red making the heart beat faster and the blue has a very calming effect, he puts these together and creates very like special controlled environments. With a similar effect, he creates Vi Vijana 2 with shades of violet and blue and puts a glowing red, orange, and yellow together from the center. So the first item is Sergei Devasa Badger's Chincheta Center Table, which manufactured in 1988. The designer is from Barcelona, and the Chincheta means drawing pin in Spanish, and the center table is for coffee or gatherings, usually as a living room. The overall treatment is minimal and modern from a movement that favored decorative yet sentimental pieces that was even more experimental with materials. The urge to express in this unconventional design was a new trend, thus pieces of this of this time were more sculptural. This piece was constructed by cutting and bending and spraying paintings, sheets, sheet aluminum, a super durable and lightweight metal, then finishing with flat black epoxy to prevent the atom from further contamination and rust. Therefore, there is a clear simplicity in the making of this table, the bending of a circular sheet frees the table from spending further time and material on leg joints. This structure also provides structural stability and the tips are cast aluminum too. A similar piece of furniture would be the temper chairs by Ron Arad and they are made from 1986. They are made out of sprung stainless steel sheets and wing nuts. The design began with Ron replicating the form of a club chair using paper, and then he wanted to make a very material true chair where nothing would be absolutely permanent. And to achieve this, he used wing nuts instead of welding the joints together. Here, wing nuts are usually used for fastening bikes and drums, and they are notable for their low requirement on putting pressure to secure things, therefore domestic use. The purpose was, it is a piece that what you see is what you get, there is no illusion. Whereas, the only illusion the audience would get is how the chair behaves like a waterbed, acts springing when the weight of the human body is put on the tension on the thin sheets of steel. And how the two furniture linked together? In the beginning of the 20th century, modern architects and designers believed in a truth to materials. They believed that steel would tell them how to be used and wood would do the same, and glass and concrete. There was a new form of engagement with materials, less on the functionality and craftsmanship, but how they served purpose when interacted with the body, especially on how industrial material was taken into domestic spaces. In fact, these two furniture pieces on sheet metal are relevant with one another, but also with the works of Brazilian artist Ligia Clarks especially her maquettes from 1964. These are triangular and quarter cut sheet aluminum pieces bent and steel pin hinged. Thus the form isn't permanent and is very movable, manipulating light and the geometrical silhouette whenever the joints are moved around. There is a sense of finding movement and life from these very cool materials which are the sheet metals from all three of the artists and designers where Sheet metal, originally an industrial material, serves the exact opposite purpose of mass production. These artists and designers are altering this material by hand for their individual purposes, for furnitures and for artworks. And there's a sense of thinking that these sheet metals as rectangular pieces then wanted to manipulate them into three-dimensional, functional and non-functional objects. Monfils Group also known as Monfils Milano, is a group of architects and designers founded by Atore Sotas. 
from 1980 to 1987 that produced postmodern home goods. They are widely renowned for their asymmetrical, colorful, playful, and geometric takes on furniture. One of the furniture is the Carlton Room Divider by designer and founder Atore Sotas from 1981, made of wood and plastic laminate. His works play with the concept of room divider by combining the functional and visual elements of a space divider, bookcase, and chest of drawers. The wood is created with fairly cheap material, MDF, and cheap plastic laminate. It is sold for a high-end audience as it is designed with sculptural alternating bodies of vibrant colors. This piece is recognized as a complex shelf that can hold many books at many different angles and also looks like a robot greeting the user with open arms or even a many-armed Hindu goddess. Some other works of similar style indicate references architectural form from other global locations such as Casablanca, Beverly, Palm Springs, and Manhattan. The Memphis group takes their impressions from the cities and translate them into unconventional geometrical shapes that place with inorganic, sharply cut out shapes and uh, spheres, translucent or vibrantly pigmented. Their ambiguity in producing furniture is of similarity of abstract art rather than representational art. In the furniture pieces by Memphis, there is an illusion of space and reality that empowers the domestic space. There is an anti-restriction in what a single piece of furniture can be, whether it is to give it multiple purpose or to become less function and material effection contains of multiple purposefully incoherent aesthetic. Many of these Memphis group pieces will not even provide the audience with what purpose they serve for, whereas the audience is not provided with instructions so they are intended to form their own special object-to-body or function relationship under purchase.